Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Rob Bolden, and welcome to another episode of Pull Back the Curtain, episode eight. Hard to believe we've been at this for eight weeks, but we are so happy to be back with you for yet another episode this week. And um, joining me is one of uh, my colleagues, special guest, Jason Bray. I'll tell you a little bit about him in just a minute. But before we do, uh, I want to remind everybody that um, coming up of a few special events uh, uh, that are coming up. This Sunday, we have um, our, our resident artist welcome party, which is going to be live. Facebook, YouTube, check it out on our website. Um, you can register there. Uh, Christopher Hahn, our general director, and Bill Powers, our managing director, will engage in a lively conversation with all seven of our resident artists, six singers, one stage director, a great way to uh, meet them, introduce them publicly, and we couldn't be more happy that we're going to be doing it, in this case, live for all of you. Next Sunday, the 20th, um, is our annual Rising Stars concert. For those of you who have attended in the past, this is an opportunity for the public to essentially uh, get to know the resident artists vocally. This is the first time they get to hear them. And um, in this case, in this iteration, during this pandemic, we are doing that virtually as well. So again, check out our website for details about that next Sunday, the 20th. Two great events coming up. As always, uh, I'd like to start the show by thanking anyone who's tuning in, all of you who have tuned in, all of you who support Pittsburgh Opera. It's because of people like you that we are able to do the work that we do. So if you are so inclined, um, you can check out the one-click donation link in the comments section. You also can check out, scrolling on the bottom there, pittsburghopera.org slash give now if you want to hit us up with a few dollars and continue this uh, continue this work, especially in the midst and what's coming in this coming season. So with that said, on with today's show. I am uh, super excited to, to welcome today's guest, Jason Bray, Pittsburgh Opera costume shop manager, um, fashion uh fashion icon extraordinaire, if you will. Uh, those of you who uh, grace, the people who grace our stage are often, um, you know, it's, it's because of Jason and his excellent team in the costume shop that they look so good. But Jason, um, not just a costume shop manager, but also a designer in his own right. And he has um, been a part of Cirque du Soleil, Blue Man Group, um, Harry Potter as part of uh, the Universal Studios experience. He's been all over the world and I'm thrilled to have him with me today. So I'm going to bring him into the stream, welcome him to pull back the curtain today. And it looks like, there we go. Jason, can you hear me? I can. Fantastic. Yeah, welcome. Yeah. Right. Welcome, welcome. Well, I, I, I sort of hit on some big bullet points, um, and, you know, in your in in the introduction, uh, things from Cirque du Soleil to Blue Man Group to the, is it it's a, called the Harry Potter Experience or Harry uh, Potter the Wizarding World of Harry Potter? The Wizarding World of Harry Potter, um, as well as having designed productions for us in recent seasons, uh, as recently as Alcina, The Last American Hammer, Afterwards, Glory Denied. Um, but first, let's start with the basics. At Pittsburgh Opera, your title here technically is Costume Shop Manager. So tell, uh, tell us a little bit about what, what that is. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, I, I oversee the, the crew in the costume shop. Um, so from, from design, to completion. Um, so if I'm not the designer, then I'm interfacing with with the designer that's come in and um, and organizing everything that needs to be completed, uh, from you know, pattern making to to fabric purchasing to all, all the all the elements that go into creating the costumes. All the things that the audience member never get to see. I'm guessing. Uh, what was that? All the things that we as audience members, we don't really get to see. What we get to see are the beautiful finished products. Um, 
yeah, so there's there's all the all the things that go into all the minute little details that go into getting the costumes from point A to point B, um, you know, it, fittings and and organization on the, the garment racks and getting the, the the costumes over to the theater, all those things. So, yeah, so yes, behind the scenes, which is where my job usually is and where I'm most comfortable. <laughs> Not today, my friend. You are front and center today, um, as well as deserve it as it is. So tell me a little bit about, before coming to Pittsburgh, um, these other experiences, Harry Potter, Universal Studios, Blue Man Group, Cirque du Soleil, Tell me a little bit about those experiences and and what they taught you or or you know how they informed this job that you currently have. Um well uh I mean not to discount my I mean my opera experience before that um I I come from Portland Oregon and, and uh, had worked at Portland Opera there for quite a few years um, where I caught the opera bug. And uh, so, yeah, worked there as a first hand in the costume shop and a design assistant and a, an assistant to the shop manager there. But then also uh, worked quite a few years at uh, a company called Michael Curry Design for a designer named Michael Curry, who uh, is most famous for designing Lion King on Broadway with Julie Taymor mm. and, and several other uh, actual opera productions as well, um, including there's a Magic Flute production for the Met. Um, and uh, one of my favorite productions uh, was a Julie Taymor Oedipus, <clears throat> which was done at a, a opera festival in Japan, uh, starring uh, Jesse Norman as uh, Yocasta. Oh, wow. One of my favorite pieces. Anyhow, so yeah, caught the opera bug was able to then go on and work at this other place, who he is, he's contracted a lot by, uh, as we mentioned, Disney, um, Universal Studios, Blue Man Group, as you mentioned, uh, Cirque du Soleil, all sorts of Las Vegas institutions, um, and, uh, you know, the Olympics and the Super Bowl, and, you know, any, anything that requires a grand spectacle, Michael, Michael has his hands in somewhere at some point. Um, so, yeah, that's where I got a taste for the over-the-top and large, lush budget theatrical world. Um, your, your question, how does that inform my job here? Um, well, I, I'm, after having worked in, you know, opera and other theatrical companies um, with costume, uh, and then going on to this other, you know, quite bizarre <laughs> engineered experience, um, I have, I have sort of a, a unique knowledge uh, of, of, you know, like, say with a show like Alcina, uh, how, how do you put antlers on top of a performer's head? Or how do you, how do you make a, a, a crown light up? Or, or that kind of thing. So that's that's kind of how that informs my my design currently. Is that I I, I have that in my wheelhouse and I get to pull it out <laughs> occasionally. I would think that um, you know being be being an opera or stage designer in in some cases as as you are, but having those other experiences on a more grand spectacle would do just that. They they allow. I don't want to assume, but they they allow your imagination to think outside the box, probably in some ways more so than maybe maybe others along the way, because of you've seen kind of what's absolutely possible and then what what you can bring to the operatic stage. Would that be a fair assumption? Yeah, yeah, I would I would say that. Yeah, <laughs> tell me, um, as a designer as a costume shop manager, um, as a as somebody who works backstage or works with costumes regularly, do you have any crazy, crazy stories? Do you have any, or something that just blew your mind that you got to work on um, along the way as part of your career? Um, well, prior to coming to Pittsburgh, I had just wrapped up uh, working on the grand opening of the Shanghai Disney theme park. 
uh, which which that that whole opening ceremony is available on YouTube if you're interested. If you just Google that, ah. um, that was quite an experience. And then also following that was working in Japan at Harry Potter World, the Wizarding World of Harry Potter in Universal Studios there in Osaka, um, working on some some interesting night shows there and. Uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm never sure what it is I'm allowed to talk about and what I'm not allowed to talk about. But <laughs> in terms of IP, intellectual property, yeah, in terms of intellectual property and and licensing and all of those things. Um, um, but I, I will just say that I, I interfaced with some technology that I, I would not normally get to interface with, and um, the the dressing of um, drones was was part of the project. Fancy, fancy. I want to bring up one of our comments, uh, you know, while we're going, as I said, you know, you are somebody who, you know, makes us all look good on the stage. And, uh, you know, Roy Simmons here, Jason is the best, a Pittsburgh influencer for sure. Uh, Roy, sweet. I, I don't want to leave out the fact that, um, forgive me if I'm misquoting this, but you were, you were named, um, uh in you were named in the top top people in pittsburgh in the in incline magazine um a year or two ago am i correct about that yeah it was the who's next in fashion under under 40 which is um which is almost not the case any longer <laughs> but you made it and you got the distinction, which is great. It looks like we, in the comments section, uh, it looks like we also grabbed the YouTube link probably of those opening ceremonies. Oh. So when we're done here, anybody wants to check that out, please do. I'm sure it is yeah. quite the spectacle. Um, I do want to shift gears to, and, and bring it bring it home, if you will, um, and because I think it's important, as I said earlier, that you know there's a lot of things that happen in your world, in your shop, that I don't think we know of, uh, but what we do end up seeing are these gorgeous costumes or these really creative costumes. And um, I think it's really interesting to be a part of the process as you or I might be, but some of the subtleties along the way, um, you know, those things that go into it are really intricate and, and people don't always get to get to fully appreciate. So not to, not to take us down the, the intricacies and the subtleties, but I'd love to hear a little bit about um, your process. Uh, and we've got some images that, that you and I took a look at. It doesn't just go from thought to final, you know, to sewing machine to actor, does it? Not, not quite, no. Um, <laughs> uh, Let's yeah. take Alpina, for example, because that's one of your most recent and one of those fantastical pieces. Um, and you shared with me some early sketches that, if I, if I may, I'd like to share, you know, here. Yeah, sure. um, might help give people a little bit of a sense of kind of where you start. I'm going to take you and I. And, and what are we looking at here, Jason? Well, these are just first rough sketches to get the conversation going about the direction of the costume. And <clears throat> what you're actually not seeing is that before this, there's probably, you know, a thousand other images that are collected and discussed with the director. Um, so, you know, every, every company is a little different in how they like to approach a design process. Every director is going to be different in how they approach a design process. Um, but, you know, ultimately, it's the director, then the designer's job to tell the story visually, um, you know, provide some context for understanding. So in the case of Alcina, uh, it, pre it, it presents something of a challenge in that it's not, it's not a widely known story. Um, it, it, it's you know, it's sort of akin to maybe Arthurian legend or something where, that people are more familiar with. You know, people are probably more familiar with Merlin and, and, and King Arthur and those characters, but they're maybe not as familiar with, say, you know, the Ruggeros and the R Rinaldos, right? Which they're all sort of very related in, in this like medieval epic world. Um, so, so there's a lot of conversations that had to be ha had up front about, um, you know, 
how how are we going to tell this story? Um, that's what, what I was. What time period are we going to set it in? You know, what what is the original setting? What time are we going to set it in? And um, what is the setting? And and what other elements are we going to add to that along the way? So in that image, you you sort of see the the, the beginnings of of discussing you know color scheme as it relates to each character, uh, different silhouettes, uh, it, developing. And, and starting to, to work in certain details that, that start to tell us who these characters are in the world that we're creating. Yeah, so it really is a conversation from the get-go and there's lots of leeway here in, in many directions. I mean, obviously there's design concept, but once, once we get there, you, the director, other team members can, can essentially go down the path of exploration or um, you're you're free to explore for a while. Is that safe to say? Uh, well, I mean, the the director, the stage director, will usually guide that process. So they will have a, a general idea of what it is they they would like the, the team to come together on and, and work into. Um, so in this instance, you know, Matt Haney, the director, wanted to emphasize the <clears throat> the themes of beauty and and brutality. Um, and and really play into also sort of the absurdity of of the of the piece um, and, and uh, yeah I mean we 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 have the challenge in, in a small show like that of of it being sort of it, well not sort of quite truncated right so mm -hmm. the show's reduced down from how many hours is Alcina, three to four hours normally, um, down to 90 minutes or less. Characters are removed, you know, whole, whole chunks of storyline are, are cut. Um, so we're, we're, we're left with how do, we, how do we convey this story with just these, you know, six or seven people. And um, that's, that's where a, a piece like Alcina is really great because it is a fantasy piece and you can, you can go in so many different directions and, and sort of go over the top in order to really show you who this person is because we're not getting the backstory, you know. Alcina kind of lands right, you know, in the center of a, of a great epic that, that spans many different tales and involves right. these different yeah. characters who are all related somehow. Um, and who people of the time when the opera was written, written would have been maybe more familiar with. Um, but so, yeah, so, so we're, we're, we're discussing, you know, how, how do we show Alcina's progression through this, you know, and, and, and how are we, how are we showing that Ruggiero is under a spell and how are we showing that, that Meliso is, is this, wise guide for Bradamante and, and all these all these issues that well let's take a look at a few of these things so we saw the initial sketches with some patterns that might have made it to it um but let's take a look quickly at uh you know from there we jump to some more colorful renderings so we might we get something like this which is a rendering of Ruggiero and then from there we get this beautiful production photo and you can see the progression. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. And you mentioned earlier the sort of light up crown uh, of Ruggiero. Yeah. Um, so for Alcina, Ruggiero was sort of my keystone character and sometimes it's, designing a whole show can sometimes be really daunting, especially if there's like, you know, a whole chorus and all these extra moving parts that we don't typically have in a small Kappa show. Um, but, but with a world that's so vast, like this world of Alcina, uh, I found it helpful to sort of pick a character, a very central character, and, and the whole opera really does revolve around, I mean, the, the title character is Alcina, but the, the, the character that this whole story revolves around is, is Ruggiero, and the reason everybody's here is because of Ruggiero, um, because he keeps running away <laughs> from, from Bradamante. Uh, so I chose Ruggiero to sort of design first and, and, and get a feel for where I wanted to go in terms of the aesthetic. Um, and, and so he's, yeah, so Ruggiero sort of becomes the keystone. So he really didn't change a 
whole lot from start to finish. But yeah, the, you mentioned the crown, and that's where we come into, you know, the, the director and I had lots of conversations about how do we show physically, visually, when Ruggiero is, is under the spell versus not. And so the, the idea of having this, this crown that was present and then not present after the spell is broken and there was all this, um, all this uh, concept around alchemy that had to do with, with, um, with Alcina being sort of the central character on her island um, and, and the magical people on the island representing different, different uh, alchemical elements. So we had Alcina representing the element of air and her, her bird attendants that... Well, let's that, bring her in actually while we're talking about her so we can have a quick look. Let me take, sure. out, let me take Ruggiero out of here. Now, Alcina, um, as we had discussed early, there was an initial rendering, um, which is this first one, darker, um, but we ended up in a rendering that looks sort of, that got lightened up is where we are. And so sometimes yeah. there's a pivot during the process, right? Right. Well, yeah, quite, as you can tell. So yeah, we, we started with, with the idea that Alcina would be a very dark, you know, more, more witchy looking character. But um, then as the set evolved, evolved and, and, you know, colors needed to change and, you know, uh, trying to, trying to convey Alcina as a little bit of a softer character than maybe she's usually portrayed. Um, she got a little lighter and um, added more of her air elements maybe in there with, with feather uh, print and, and uh, yeah, so. Yeah, well, let's take a look at uh, a production photo actually from where she ended up in the actual show. I'll bring you back in here as well so we can all see you too. But you can see how it went from light to light, if you will. The progression, we had a darker rendering and then, um, but it is kind of amazing for me to watch these as well, go from rendering to stage. And I think that's what's fascinating about this process. Yeah. Um, yeah, and you know, the progression of her too had to do with tying her in with her sister Morgana. And, um, yeah, so who, who was representing the element of water. So we had to somehow tie in air and water and Orante as the earth and the hunter and all, all these. Speaking of Morgana, fun. We've got this uh, one last <laughs> image we have of her, but this beautiful render. There she is. Yeah. And then we have this show production photo, and there she is there. There she is. Yeah. So, you know, conversations around a character like Morgana is like, well, how do we portray her as, as kind of a, well, a dingbat, really. I mean, she, <laughs> she's, she's a bit of a dingy character, um, but, you know, she's a, she's a very sympathetic character as well. So they're just trying to work in, like, how do we show this element of water that we want her to represent? How do we make her sort of this slightly more promiscuous, a little bit dingy character? Um, so, yeah, so she's kind of in her underwear and in a bit of a mermaidy costume. <laughs> I'm going to take the rendering out so we can have a little closer look, a little closer look at the production photo. But there she is, lovely Natasha Wilson. Um, but it, it really is a ride from beginning to end and a really big collaborative process. Um, and once, you know, I would, I would venture a guess. Yeah, no, and to that point, um, you know, part of, part of what makes me uncomfortable about such grand introductions <laughs> is that, um, you know, it is such a collaborative process. And, and what I really did want to mention is, especially in this industry, I know it's sort of a universal truth everywhere, but no one is an island under themselves in this industry. Right. The, the, the immense amount of number of, of people in, in depart different departments and different teams and the, and labor unions that go into producing something, you know, in a place like Michael Curry design, like I, I, I certainly cannot take full, 
full credit for for a lot of my work. I mean, even over my whole career, I can only really, really take a, take credit for a small percentage, you know, fully personally. Um, but yeah, and I think it's also important to note, that, you know, we are we are sort of fortunate in in Pittsburgh that we are we're we're able to go ahead with some productions, but all those people that we mentioned, all of these teams of people in different companies all over the world are, are many of them out of work at the moment. So the, the, we are fortunate to be forging forward here. Agreed. I, I think that that's a really good point. So I'm, I'm really glad you brought that up because it is a really good point that, um, you know, while you may be costume shop manager or in some cases designer, you know, it really does take a team. We have a team here at Pittsburgh Opera that accomplishes these 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 renderings these drawings um that gets them you know from page to stage if you will and and to your point and it's a great one we are very fortunate in the current climate that we are able to to move forward and to progress and and present a season um uh, this this coming year especially in light of everything so i i i think it's great uh, a really good point and i appreciate you bringing that up and and yeah. um certainly not lost on on anyone and um speaking about the season in brief uh we've got we've got four productions um you are uh, sort of designing or overseeing design for a few of them is that correct yeah i'm I'm the resident costume designer, I believe, for, as far as I know, the first three productions. Yeah. Great. And we'll be managing, of course, the final. Can you tell us uh, anything about any of them? Maybe the first one, a, a few um, tidbits? Sure. Can... Yeah. So, and speaking of collaboration, that's a great, a great segue because we are. I'm, I'm have, I have the great pleasure of working currently with with stage director Crystal Manage, who's just one of the best collaborators and um, that really is one of my very favorite parts of this job is the collaboration. Um, but yeah, so Cosi Fantute, uh, set in 1918 during World War One, and so we're able to work in the fact that the singers are masked on stage and ah. uh, yeah. <laughs> and, the the setting so so yeah so crystal has decided that that we're setting it in that time period and uh, we're not changing the 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 national setting necessarily we're still in Italy uh, but we are in a in a munitions factory in World War One so uh, Don Alfonso is the is the owner of the factory and Dora Bella and Fiore di Ligi have have been made to go work in this factory and their, their boyfriends, Guglielmo and uh, Ferrando, have come to work there as well while they are not off at war. And uh, uh, Despina is the cleaning lady in the, <laughs> in the factory. Uh, yeah, so you can, you can look forward to some, to some you know, pretty uh, period costumes and uh, some, some kind of funny old Hollywood take on the, the Albanian uh, disguises and uh, there might be mustaches on masks, maybe. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> a huge, wonderful challenge uh, that I'm sure you and your crew are up for, no doubt. Um, Jason, before we go, one question did come in, uh, and I thought this was good to, to sort of pose before we let you go. Um, the question is, um, and thank you, Mark Abramowitz, for posing this, but um, with Alcina costumes, were they designed with specific uh, singers in mind, um, and were they could they potentially be easily adaptable afterward? Uh, so yeah, that's a good question. Um, well, yes, the we we do know the cast beforehand as we're designing because I mean it is a resident artist show, so we we do try to design specifically for them. Um, but yeah. Uh, Theatrical costumes, opera costumes are are typically made in such a way as to uh, ensure longevity and mm. reusability because productions are quite expensive to create from scratch, which is why, you know, m so many of our, our main stage productions, we, would, we consider that a rental, right? So we would be getting a whole package from another 
another company and, and altering to fit our purposes. Um, so yeah, so yeah, that's, I mean, that's ultimately, and it's a funny story, ultimately how I got really involved professionally in theater. I started in a fashion design program, but I was working in the costume shop on campus and I started sewing like a costume person instead of a couturier, you know, and, and got in trouble in my fashion classes and decided I liked costume better. And, and that's really how that happened. <laughs> the rest is history, as they say. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, your, your, uh, your pivot into that or your uh, getting slapped on the wrist is our gain, certainly to have you um, not only part of the industry, but certainly part of Pittsburgh Opera. And uh, we're glad you're here and the work that you do is always great. And we're looking forward to several more shows uh, this season as well. So um, Jason, thank you for taking a little bit of time out of your day. I know that the costume shop is open and you have all, you have all started working and um, you know getting ready for the season so I know things are kind of getting into full swing so again thank you for taking the time today and uh, and hanging out with us for just a little bit of your day no problem yeah we're all we're all masked and socially distanced down there at our our respective uh, workstations <laughs> yeah I can imagine I know as we are up in the main office and coaching studios and all of that so uh, but thank you so much, Jason. It's been it's been great talking to you and, and um, you know, adding some of that insight. And now all of you out there in the world who come to see our shows have a little insight into what all those details are that you might see and might not know what are, but know that they were thought of in depth by Jason, his team, his collaborators, directors, other designers. So, um, yeah, Jason, thanks so much. Appreciate you being here today and uh, I'll see you soon. All right. All right, be well. Bye. Well, indeed, uh, thank you, Jason Bray, for joining us. Uh, it's been a pleasure. It was a pleasure chatting with him, um, as it is all my guests. And I hope all of you did get a little insight into all of the detail work that goes into those costumes. Um, we're very fortunate, as Jason said, that we are able to present a season, and he and his team are working to get that ready uh, in the upcoming season. And we're we're we can't wait to present you know these pieces for you. Um, just a couple of reminders, as I said at the beginning, uh, this Sunday, if you are so interested, you can join us for the Rising Stars um, welcome party. Please do tune in. Christopher Hahn, Bill Powers, asking lively questions of our uh, seven resident artists. And then next Sunday, the 20th, we have our Rising Stars concert. Uh, the first time you'll get a chance to hear some of these uh, incredible young singers uh, live, live streamed. Um, both, uh, both, uh, both parties, uh, both things are on our live streaming platforms, Facebook, YouTube, and you can check all of that out on our website, www.pittsburghopera.org. Uh, thank you again for joining me for another episode of Pull Back the Curtain. We will see you once again next week with uh, another terrific guest. Take a look at some of the aspects of Pittsburgh Opera or opera in general, performing arts. So until then, uh, be well. Thanks so much for being here, and we will talk to you soon. Take care.